Okay, um, well, thank you very much to uh, Yanis and, and Gert for inviting me here. And um, it's, it's been a really fascinating conference so far, and I've, I've learned a heck of, heck of a lot. Um, I'm going to present about the phenomenon of crypto cities. And my research for the past 10, 12 years has been, um, I, my background is fine art, fine art photography. Uh, so really, a lot of this is informed by photo, photographic discourse, photographic theory. But also, the intersection of um, uh, photography and the real estate market, um, really thinking through ideas about the political implications of architectural representation, particularly um, digitally networked architectural representation. So that really is my, my thing, you know, the exclusions and inclusions of images such as this one. And I chose this one as your kind of typical um, photorealistic rendering of an off-plan uh, real estate development. My argument, to summarize it, uh, where this all begins, is, is um, thinking about these photorealistic renderings of uh, buildings that, don't come, that are not yet in existence, and theorizing that they borrow the truth function of photography. They appear photographic. And one of the elements of, photograph of photography is, of course, its ability to uh, double the real uh, and trace uh, an indexical link to its origins via chemical or digital means. So that indexical link here is reversed. The, uh, my argument is that the more realistic these uh, images are, the more likely they are to come into being. So um, by recruiting capital, by recruiting investment, um, we see the reversal of, of that causal chain between the, the referent and its, its, uh, its sign. Um, the, the reality uh, comes after the sign of its production. So it's, it's a causality in reverse, or reverse indexicality, as I like to call it. So um, a lot of discussion about indexicality in photographic theory, as you know, but here I, my argument is that, to some extent mechanically, but also just the way in which we're, we're a culture to look at these images, we internalize that notion of indexicality and what it means. So I t I've taken this in various directions and presented quite a few papers on this, this kind of strand of things, again, looking at new different types of renderings. And, and part of my methodology is to produce typologies of, of these kind of projects. The, the one previous to this one, the, the typology I built before this one was based on university campus developments and theorizing um, th this, uh, this whole idea. So I'm just going to get presenter view up if I can, if it will let me. Um, that a university campus, in the, in the condition of the digital rendering, it prefigures uh, um, spaces for the production of knowledge. So what these images do is they speculate on what a, a container for the production of new knowledge would look like. And this is Zaha Hadid's um, building in, uh, in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University Innovation Tower. Um, so obviously, it, it, there's an idea here of what new, uh, the space that new knowledge would um, inhabit, or the, a space for incubating new knowledge. By extension, anything that doesn't, that can't be contained in these shells, the, these images, is no, is no longer knowledge in a sense. So it produces at the same time uh, a certain framing of knowledge. Uh, so I had a look at loads of these kind of campuses, and they're, they're various different types. They're very different tropes. Uh, visual cues, different styles of, of university campus, but, but a projective uh, or speculative university campus um, developments. So this typological method really is just look at all these kind of projects that don't yet exist all at various different locations all over the world, different political contexts, different kind of economic and, and social contexts, and then try to work out what the image is revealing, what kind of... Um, uh, again, looking very closely at the image. Here, there's the notion of speed, there's the notion of a, you know, um, it's next to, a, next to a, a freeway. And again, it borrows that kind of trope from glitch mechanics. In a certain sense, it represents the breakdown of um, the photographic apparatus at speed. So, you know, motion blur, um, those kind of uh, effects of um, interpolated video, the attempts to represent time, attempts to represent speed. So it speaks a very familiar language. So this thing about time and time reversing is, is really, really interesting to, to this whole theory. So I'm going to go through some theoretical background first, and then we'll move on to the pictures. Um, really just thinking about financial futures, financialization, financialized capitalism. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about performative economics. 
And there's some discussion this morning, some really interesting points where people are talking about ritual, and yesterday the word invocation was used. And in my abstract, I used the word hyperstition. And all of these, these kind of magical uh, mode, this way of recasting economics as a form of magic, as a form of influencing the future, as, as forcing the hand of chance in a way, um, are really interesting in the context of images which are supposed to trace a kind of reality of, uh, of existence or to project a reality to come. Um, uh, reading a lot about kind of the performative turn in economics and reading people like Laura Baer, who sees um, in the field of economics thinking about how speaking the future into being is, is a really interesting uh, and very key concept to contemporary capitalism, that just by the use of words, the use of language, the use of concepts, um, uh, we can actually influence the markets right now in the present moment and, and create change, create, create capital, accrue capital right, you know, right now while appearing to talk about the future. So this idea of a performative capitalism is, is one thing we need to hold on to while looking at these pictures. This is, my, this is my critical, one of my critical tools, my critical grid, um, and I kind of apply this to my typologies in the, in the sense of looking at putting these things into boxes helps me identify you know, whether I'm looking at um, ideas of the past of the present, the present of the present, and the future of the future. And I think one thing that attracted me to write about crypto cities is that we're definitely sitting in this box here, the future of the future. We're looking at a speculative economic system, and we're looking at speculative cities. So we're looking at this, this um, I'm going to skip to that slide, yeah? So you can see the kind of way in which we can use these categories to think that crypto cities, they're, they're, they are the future of the future. That, you know, if, if, the, if the, the, the currency is speculative and the images and the city itself is a speculative construct. But of course, in this box below it, we've got renderings of crypto cities which exist in the present. So the images I'm looking at sit in this box um, down here, renderings... Uh, of course, of uh, what would appear to be in the box above. Um, and I'll be reading a lot about um, black swans and reading uh, a particular writer called Eli Iash, who some of you may have come across. He wrote a book called The Blank Swan in response to Nic Nicholas Taleb's very famous black swan, um, the byline, The End of Probability. He's a quant, he trades, in, he trades derivatives, and he's also very interested in philosophy. But his argument um, about pure contingency, he argues that calculating the price of a derivative is almost irrelevant because as soon as it hits the market, if you trade that derivative, that future, that option on the market, um, you have to trade it at variance to the idealized market price. Because of course, if you can work out the market price of a derivative mathematically, then everybody on the floor would be trade, would, there'd be nothing to trade. There'd be no differential between those trades. So the market is the site of pure <coughs> contingency, the medium of pure contingency. And for me, this idea of contingency reflects back to photography, because of course photography is meant to be the, the prime medium for reproducing pure contingency and rendering it into some kind of form. My other contention with this grid is to, is to look at the way in which these different boxes contain different notions of temporality. And capital flows between these boxes. Each of these boxes is the site of a particular kind of asset, but in order to generate capital flows, it's the play of different temporalities that interests me and the way in which um, we might cast ourselves, we'll cast each of these assets in these different boxes in a completely different causal chain, a different temporality, um, a different way of thinking about time. And I think there's been very interesting discussions about, for example, um, progress narratives and you know, there are all sorts of ideas of temporality that, that have been discussed over the past few days and, and in the presentations to come. But that notion of a, of a single temporality, we're in this stage of, of capitalism where some people are moving very fast and other people are moving very slow. People are moving to different temporal narratives. And if we think of um, our disciplinary backgrounds and our own particular research, then we miss the way in which somebody over here knows something completely different from us and has a different figuration of temporality to the one that we are in. So that the element of the, how this affects the notion of the rendering of the architectural project is that it's asking you to imagine yourself into a future, but the way in which it plays on it is different depending on where you sit in relation to the market. And hopefully this will become clear as we kind of move through. Um, I'm also talking about agnotolo agnotological capitalism. I'm reading a lot of, um, again, this, this goes back to thinking about the way, the, the crash of 2008. 
and about how capitalism trades on a manufactured sense of ignorance. Um, two months before the crash of 2008, auditors Ernst and Young pronounced Lehman Brothers as financially sound. But two months later, of course, they're discovered not to be financially sound. Two months after that, uh, Satoshi publishes his famous white paper. So there's the two textual events and a crash in the middle. But this notion of agnotological capitalism was, of course, you have these huge auditing companies, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Ernst & Young, who are also deeply invested in education. Um, and they're, of course, setting the terms of knowledge by which the market is to be understood. But that knowledge is variable. Yeah, so I love this <laughs> form <laughs> because this is a, a poll by Global Data, which, which you know, on, on researching for this, this presentation, I, it's asking me how much I understand about these technologies, which I thought was great. Um, but of course, you know, it's not, it, it's actually going to be quite happy if I don't understand them because I, I could, they can make money out of me then. Um, agnological capitalism also extends into this, the field of what's called ignorant studies which is fantastic. And again, a lot of people in the field of ignorance studies are writing about um, you know, the crash of 2008 and, the, and the, the way in which ignorance creates capital. And again, this relates back to photography because photography is supposed to be revelatory of facts in the world. But can you have a photography uh, in the form of the rendering which actually creates a reality out of ignorance? Can you look at the indexical trace to non-knowledge in these renderings? Okay, so there's very contentious and very pretentious kind of arguments which I'm going through, which hopefully will become clear. And this is all within the context of what I would like to call FAFO finance, uh, where um, the precautionary principle is under attack. <laughs> okay? Talk of, re talk of deregulation in uh, the field of crypto and the removal of constraints. Often these constraints are put in place by very well meaning social democratic and, and democratic systems following events where people have suffered some crisis, in which case this regulation is deemed necessary in order to um, put, you know, in order to protect the citizenry from, you know, that these things, a the regulation is put in place. So reversing these regulations means also reversing the causal chain again. It's reversing the trace. Obviously, a case had to be proved in a court of law that something happened in order for this regulation to put in place. To be, but, but if you're going to deregulate, you're also reversing that evidential trail between the proof that needed to be provided in the court of law for the regulation to be applied, and um, you get the argument. It, it's, um, yeah, we just had to, anyway, I won't go into my local politics, but this idea of deregulation, again, creates risk. We are manufacturing risk, and we are manufacturing contingency by uh, removing the precautionary principle, by removing regulation. So this creates more risk, more inequality, more ignorance, and so on, and generates more capital. Okay, so we're looking at these kind of arguments for phases of the crypto market, um, the accumulation stage, stage of disbelief, the bull market, the excitement. Okay, this is, this is going to be great. You know, this, this is going to be a fantastic investment. Overconfidence, a stage of greed and anxiety, and following that, the crash. So crypto is very aware of its own cycle of uh, development, so it has been, um, and it will carry on being so. And this is one of its insurances against its, uh, against its failure is its own self-knowledge, I think. Um, but here we're looking at the stage of media and the influence of media. We're talking about all these things which are influenceable by images, by projections, by architecture, and by discourse. So is it appropriate to call something like this architecture at all? Or is this pure media? Um, this is Akon City in Senegal, which is... Um, uh, the funding for this comes from the success of a Senegalese musician. Uh, and we can see here uh, this fantastic utopian dream of a city with all its kind of Zaha Hadid-esque kind of tropes borrowed from Zaha Hadid. It's like superstar architecture is now a sign of itself. Um, but the thing I notice about these cities is, is that it's not realistic. Well, but one contention I would have is if this is a representation of a city where I'm looking at conditions of accelerated production, growth, you know, increasing wealth, prosperity. What I'm not seeing is masses of cranes. <laughs> what I'm not seeing is, is the busyness of construction. If I was to look at a city which is, which, is, which is growing, where the market is growing, it's a built, continuous building site. It's a state, it's a mess. What I'm looking at here is an ossified fossil of a city, which, which there is no visible economic activity. 
it's, it's an archive image. It's, it's an image that has no, uh, has no future in a way, apart from unless we regulate it. And the only thing I would say here is they must have a really good uh, department of heritage and heritage regulations. Everything in here must be listed in some way in order to be preserved in this pristine thing. I mean, well, you're not going to knock these things down. You just built them. Yeah? So we're looking at the prefiguring of, of heritage, really. And this links, of course, into all sorts of ways in which heritage is really valuable within this discourse. OK, so there should be more cranes. Ideally, the future city would be like a great big mobilized production line, which is continually moving, you know, continually digging resources out of the ground at the back end, funneling them through to the front end, almost like a tunneling machine that tunnels through time and then putting new kind of glass-plated buildings at the front, and then almost immediately knocking them down and shuffling things back round to the back and recycling them. I have a drawing of this, but I, I don't have it in the slides, I'm afraid. That's a future thing. The derivatives are a part of this. You know, talk about cryptos, and you guys can probably knock me down on this, and there are many people who probably know much more about this in this room than I. But the idea of crypto derivatives, the idea of a secondary market in a speculative market on a speculative currency, shall we say, is really, really interesting. Um, because, of course, the crash of 2008 was um, caused by a, um, overextended derivatives in the real estate market, of course. Uh, and to some extent, what we're looking at here is a way of keeping this going. <laughs> it's a way of keeping that dynamic going of, 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 speculat of speculative finance. Um, this is uh, Pantera, who are a, a hedge fund. Um, and they're hedge funds specializing in crypto. But they're moving into this form of hedge where they're, they're investing in this Avantis because what Avantis are doing as a, as a trading company is hedging crypto against traditional assets. So they're, um, they're building a perpetual futures and trading, trading and market protocol that aims to expand the realm of DeFi to include traditional financial projects, products and real-world assets. So they're taking the risky product of crypto and they're hedging it against pretty standard traditional assets, real estate, uh, resource extraction, etc. cetera. So the, if you've got the money to invest in a hedge fund, you have vast amounts of capital, your risk is far lower than somebody who just invests in crypto or somebody who just invests in the real estate market. What you've got to do is take a broader picture of what's actually going on under financialized capitalism and say, for those who have the capital, they can hedge that risk, and then they have the ability to almost to influence chance. Whereas we, those of us who just have one cl class of asset are working almost in a different kind of temporality. It's a different reality, in a, in a way. So um, there are lots of ways in which um, I would argue, and this is very speculative, that hedge funds need risky assets, they need risk, they need contingency, they need that market to keep producing in the way the city needs cranes. So without risk, uh, the returns that people would expect from hedge funds are not as high as they need to be to satisfy that demand that was mentioned in Stefan's paper for continual three to five percent growth of your assets. Um, so of course, you know, Bitcoin billionaires moving to Puerto Rico and, and capitalizing on favorable conditions for establishing uh, crypto trading in, um, in Puerto Rico are of course driving up property values. <laughs> and of course, they're, they're, this is being the protest against this on the basis that this is a, this is a colonial project. Um, Logan Paul, Brock Pierce here, seen as colonizers. Because despite the, you know, the, the rhetoric of decentralized finance, what happens is that land values go through the roof. This is a very traditional asset uh, which can be hedged against the risk of crypto. Oh, this is a fantastic book. Uh, Richard Dean's The Bonds of Debt, looking at the contemporary debt crisis and its influence on us. And I, I like this quote in particular um, because it refers to the effective environment of our current debt crisis. We have a cri classic capitalist crisis of, of accumulation. We have vast quantities of capital accumulated at the top of the pyramid with nothing, nowhere for it to go. So, oh, oh, the, where do we invest? Where do the people who own this stuff invest it? How do they main, maintain their assets? How do they invest their capital? At the same time, we have a debt crisis with many developing countries looking to default on, on finance. Yeah? There's different kinds of debt stack up. More than, more than ever, people find themselves too much bound to everything that exists. 
So those narratives are forcing people to buy into this continuation of the situation. So that's the that's kind of, let's, let's have a look at some pictures now of crypto cities and see how all this stuff relates to the things that we're seeing on screen. So the typology is under development. I'm going to focus on three projects, uh, three crypto cities in particular from the broader typology. And the first one I'm going to look at is the city of Prospera in um, Honduras. Anyone know this um, project? Yeah. Uh, and of course, here we see Zaha Hadid architects. Of course, without Zaha Hadid, this is Patrick Schumacher, who's the lead architect now, uh, but well-known libertarian, outspoken uh, proponent of free market values. And th the first thing, of course, that you see are beach houses and what they intend to do, of course, build new cities, maximize human prosperity. Now, just like the, the university creates a container for knowledge and by its own nature, um, in, in this architectural container, um, exclude anything that doesn't fit in the container is no longer knowledge. <laughs> so anything that doesn't fit into this particular model is no longer human. So we can here tie this back to necropolitics, the whole idea of you know, the state of exception, you know, the, the human bare life on uh, those theories to say that here we'd have a de definition of the human which is by its nature exclusive. And what I would argue is that this, this riskiness of this hu humanity that this creates is, is part of the effective dimension of the, this debt riddled environment we find ourselves in. I, I don't have Wi-Fi, so I can't click on the link because my institutional computer won't link to the, to the network. But if you go to the website, you will see four images, residential, um, manufacturing, and uh, the third category. Whichever one you click on will take you to a picture of real estate. <laughs> right? So it's like the website just takes you to a, to a real estate portal. Yeah. So really what it's trying to do is sell you, sell you housing off plan. Yeah, a fairly secure asset, no? And also land values. The background to this, of course, is in a country which has gone through great political upheaval. In 2009, the president was deposed in a, in a military coup, ushering in um, two terms of a presidency, President Hernandez, which was uh, deeply corrupt. Um, the, the previous president, uh, um, when the coup happened, was deported to the United States across national boundaries, yeah? Um, so this idea of national boundaries will come to later. Uh, we have the, the second presidency, um, which comes after that, and we have a president who's deported to the United States for on uh, drug traffic and money laundering charges. And now we have a, a, a presidency from 2002 um, president Castro, uh, first female president of Honduras, who is trying to repeal the laws uh, which established, which allowed um, Prospera to take root in Honduras. And Prospera are now taking Honduras to court for $11 billion on the basis of investor state dispute laws under the free trade agreement uh, linking Dominican Republic and Central America. So all this maximizing human prosperity, I mean, you know, they stand to, you know, they're, they're literally taking the state to court for 11 billion in order to um, establish a city to maximize uh, human prosperity. Anyway, um, what's it look like? This human prosperity well, it looks a bit like this. It's uh, um, the kind of Zaha, post-Zaha Hadidian kind of developments. Again, it looks very nice. Um, and there's some amazing kind of puff pieces around in the, in the press. Um, promoting this, this amazing lifestyle. The people who move here are described as pioneers. You know, they're pushing the boundaries of, of human um, uh, experience. Starting a new society from scratch at a new frontier. Look at the colonialism here. This is just in your face, is it not? <laughs> it's a rare opportunity in life. And while this may be frightening for some, I can't help but see a profoundly inspiring opportunity to be a pioneer in shaping an environment I want to live in, compared to just admiring the greatness of what my ancestors built. Uh, we were talking about uh, what our ancestors built in conversation with Yanis uh, last night. Um, this is great. I mean, what if you could be immersed again in the entrepreneurial vibrancy and hustle of living in the early days of cities like Singapore, Hong Kong, or Dubai? <laughs> <laughs> 
or many of the European medieval cities, city-states, the American frontier. Wow, we can rediscover what it was like to be a, to be a cowboy on the American frontier. Oh, gosh, anyway, never mind. It just explains itself, no? Um, yes, uh, this is uh, somebody who's definitely invested. I just love the way in which he poses himself as a worker in a... In a, in a this, this costume. <laughs> that really is quite, quite something about how he sees himself as some kind of um, proletariat. This is probably my favorite, fav one of my favorite quotes in the world ever from the literary critic, English literary critic, William Empson, who wrote Milton's God, The Structural Complex Words, and famously, um, uh, uh, Seven Types of Ambiguity. So this, this idea of ambiguity in language is core to what he, he was puzzling through right back in the, in the mists of time in, in English literary theory. A number of young people nowadays, as one can really understand, feel that modern ideals and programs, a very mixed bag of them, have worked out so badly that the traditional ones may be better. But how badly those used to work out too seems to have been successfully kept hidden. Thus young people often join a church because they think it's the only way to avoid becoming a communist without realizing the Renaissance Christian state was itself usually a thoroughgoing police terror. So that's the Renaissance for you, yeah? <laughs> this, is, this is my go-to slide when I try to imagine the political context of the Renaissance, which was, of course, um, partly uh, the result of um, some very poor financial management on behalf of the English government who overextended themselves and fell in a complete debt crisis through funding certain crusades um, and military campaigns. Prospero, of course, just looks like your standard kind of English, when it's finished, it'll look like your standard kind of English high street. Uh, <laughs> this, is, um, this is what we're expecting. This is like something down the road from me in, in Royal Docks in London. Um, their dream of uh, this amazing future of prosperity, when you get down to, down to brass tacks and down to ground level, it looks very much like your standard urban cityscape. And again, we're, here we're, we're keying into all these discourses about cultural homogenization, architectural homogenization across the global state. There's, there's some kind of confidence here in the sense that there's, there's like slight desperation saying that, yeah, we have these fancy ideas, but we can, well, we, we can at least produce something that looks like something you already know, which is the high street. Um, but it's kind of interesting. This is Stevenage in, in the United Kingdom. I don't know if anyone knows Stevenage, if anyone's ever been there. And Stevenage was built, this is the redevelopment of Stevenage Town Centre, right? So for those of you who from the UK, the idea that Prospera is going to end up looking very much like Stevenage will be really hilariously funny, but I don't see every laughing. <laughs> yeah? Uh, Stevenage was built as a new town. In the po and we, I talked earlier about the post-war social contract and that kind of period uh, of that, after the Second World War, devastating conflict. Um, and the new towns were an att attempt by the, the, the Labour government and the new, new a under a new atmosphere of uh, democratic construction to um, build cities that aren't sort of a common good. Um, so it's uh, the first post-war new town and set the blueprint for modern living in the UK. And this is uh, Nicosia, I think. Some proposals from Nicosia. Again, you see a fairly standard template, visual template for what a prosperous high street would look like. Etienne Balibar argues that neoliberalism carries a contradiction at its heart. If it doesn't have a welfare state to dispossess, it ceases to function. So unless there's something to privatize, unless there is some kind of nationalized system for it to gut and extract value from, it ceases to function. By the time it becomes a self-contained system, it, it, it's got no drive to it, it's got no cranes, it's got no engine. Um, so the appearance is a monolinear trend towards the minimal state, but the reality is a much more conflictual situation in which absolute capitalism, which is his term, needs to make use of the very public structures and social functions that it seeks to legitimize and undermine. It must keep alive, even while starving, what it destroys continuously. If it were to destroy it, there'd be nothing to feed off. There would be no more assets to uh, privatize. So. And for Balibar, this is uh, um, linked to ideas of violence and um, the idea of the legitimization of the neoliberal project as being a construct in itself. The neoliberalism itself is a speculative idea. It has never worked anywhere, really, in the way it was, it's, it's promoted to work. So it is itself speculative. This is what Prospera actually looks like. So we've seen the renderings. This is reality. It's a fairly standard you know, timber frame house. Um, this is the beta building. So on the basis of what they want to turn this into, they're going to sue Honduras for 11 billion. 
Moving on, we're going to look at the second example, um, just in check time, and this is Lieberland, and this is a project again in which uh, Patrick Schumacher is invested, a uh, principal architect of Zaha Hadid, and it's um, it's the metaverse representation of a um, a state which already existed uh, in the buffer zone between Croatia and Serbia. The buffer zone, for those you don't know, is a tract of uninhabited land with photographs of indicted and uh, convicted war criminals on either side of it. If you ever cross that border, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so it exists in no man's land, and it is actually, um, this is the, the president, is a Czech politician called Vit Jedica, and he, of course, has been invited by the U UK. <laughs> this is, here is your, um, here is your decentralized state, um, in, in one easy slide, uh, it'd be given a prestigious award ceremony by the British Parliament, straight right to the heart of colonial power. Um, the Free Republic of Lieberland is delighted to announce that President Vit Jedlicka will be traveling to London to attend the esteemed India Today and International Book of Honor Awards at the British Parliament. Yeah, so international recognition in the media. This is what it looks like been roundly trounced for its um, comedic properties. It's nowhere near as good as Roblox or Fortnite. And <laughs> for those of you who, who play those kind of things, um, Schumacher is, uh, is a fair to middling architect, but he's no games designer. Um, this is the uh, democratic space, the Midfest City Hall. Uh, and one of the critics of, the, of this project says, well, if, this, if, if it's about decentralizing power, what is this thing that we're looking at here? It's, 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 a, it's a, a huge kind of manifestation of power in visual form, yeah? So it, it, what it says and what it looks like are two very different things. So again, you have the, the power to build a city from scratch according to your own individual will, complete, it emerges fully formed from, you, from the brain of the architect uh, without any process of public consultation whatsoever. It's just planned and they're just dumped in, in the space. And here it's dumped in metaphorical space. But it's like Decentraland, but, but weirder in the sense that you wouldn't go here to, to have a rave with crypto bros, but to kind of meet up with kind of weird kind of libertarians. And anyway, it's just uh, and these, the power stance, you know, it's, it's very interesting. A um, few shots of that. This is uh, the manifesto of um, Patrick Schumacher. Okay, total, total deregulation. deregulation. Privatise all streets, squares, public places and parks, possibly whole, whole urban districts, yeah? So it's total control of the, uh, the space of the city by the private realm, okay? But this is what it really looks like. And this is um, the sandbag house on the, um, on the territory of Liberland in the no man's land which is between Serbia and Croatia. So um, this is what they're built, this is what they think it looks like, and this is what it actually looks like, <laughs> okay? So, um, I like, again, I'm showing you these contrasts between the fantasy and the reality here. And this is, um, I'm going to, for those of you with an architectural background, this is um, for Robert Venturi's um, famous slide from uh, Learning from Las Vegas, which established, you know, the cultural importance of vernacular architecture. And this is my extension of it, the dematerialization of the decorated shed. Then actually, the decorated shed is something that really looks like a bunker, but now it's dreaming of being something um, like a megacity, uh, something like Dubai. And the, the thing is about this media representation is it doesn't actually be tied to the space at all. You can be a citizen of Prospera but not reside in Honduras. You can be a citizen of Liberland but not live anywhere in this border zone. I think it's got like a million citizens. I mean, you can't fit that many people onto that patch of land without uh, a great deal of um, hideous consequences. Um, architecture becomes a sign of itself. It becomes something that exists in order to prove the efficacy of architecture. It removes itself entirely from its function as a container of anything, apart from, like, apart from a concept of um, a futurity, a, a kind of promise uh, that at some point it will come to be realized. And um, it's speculation upon speculation on so, on so many levels. But it's also colonialist in the sense that um, this is an amazing book by Paul Mehmet. And Paul Mamet looked at the, the idea of terra nullius in Australia. Um, the colonizers of Australia, they landed, the first fleet landed in 1776. 
They saw no architecture and they assumed that there was nobody living there. <laughs> they assumed they could take it because of the absence of architecture. But of course, he reveals that there was architecture, it just didn't really look like that. So this legal contract which the British colonizers gave themselves to expropriate an entire continent was based on the absence of architecture. But here we see a repeat of the same visual trope. So it's, it's kind of like, um, it's like terra nullius in reverse. And I'm going to extend that theory, I think, as we go on. The final project uh, is a project called, I can't pronounce it, um, a AI land. <laughs> which is a seasteading project. Um, it's a floating city, and it's at the, this point in the time, it's in the, in the sea off the Seychelles in international waters. And beauty knows no bounds, I have to say, in AI land. <laughs> but I don't want to laugh about this, actually, because there's something humble about what they've done here, which I, I think with this particular one, there's a certain honesty about the way in which they haven't recruited a megastar architect. I mean, I guess they, they have to kind of make sure that it's seaworthy for starters, but I love the way in which this is the location of it, by the way, it's just there where you see, in the, it's in the sea. So I guess that, you know, they're spending a lot of time trying to work out how it would stand up to huge storms at the moment. They're, they're working with um, people who work with safety mechanisms for um, shipping in order to make sure that it's durable to some degree. Yeah. Um, again, the precautionary principle, just remind you of that one. This is what it actually looks like. Uh, there are five people living there, an assortment of pets, and they spend an awful lot of time uh, scrubbing it, maintaining it, and doing a lot of that hard manual labor to keep it, in, to keep it ship shape, as it were. And like the septic tanks drained, everything else. It's flying the flag of Liberia. But importantly, it's kind of, um, it's also, uh, it has, it, it's, a, it's not just a ship, it's not just a, a barge, it's also a marketplace. And it's a marketplace for the trading of, for the tree trade of commodities. It's kind of like a decentralized Amazon.com um, where you can buy all sorts of different things as well as invest in crypto, uh, NFTs and, and all those kind of commodities. Um, I love that slide. Accommodations are much better down. Initially we have nothing. <laughs> it's like, pioneering spirit, you know, there's also like, this idea of risk. These are people who take this risk upon themselves. And here you, you, I'm referring back to this idea of the manufacture of risk and the representation of risk. This is kind of like a lack of care of oneself elevated into a, a principle for the, for the advancement of your eventual prosperity and security. That by taking this risk to put yourself in this incredibly risky situation, to constitute yourself as a pioneer, to remove yourself entirely from the domestic, from the, from the home, from, from security, from, from the hearth and, and family, you, you, you end up in this thing where you can eventually provide for yourself and then you're establishing this as a, as a paradigm for, for other people to join in. I think that the symbolism of this is, is, is vast. It's really interesting. And the idea of shipping containers, box parks, you know, the shipping container is the new global architectural unit of choice for the up and coming um, creative classes, and the, the gentrification of international waters. The artists move in first. <laughs> I love the way they've used uh, tilt-shift camera techniques here on the, on the digital rendering. For those of you who know what that is, it's like a shop, it's like a shop with a sonar, <laughs> a sonar mounted on a drone flying across the, the sea over the Seychelles. It's amazing. Uh, this is a floating city. It stands as a testament to comfort, innovation, and modernity. Um, and it's got, you can bask in the sun or relax in the shade. Those of you from Cyprus, where would you rather be? Wow, heliparks. This is the Bibby Stockholm barge, which is, uh, for those of you who know it, if you, if you don't, in the UK context, this is um, the current government's plan to house asylum seekers uh, while they're being processed in this infested barge moored off the coast of uh, Dorset. So it's a kind of nod to the, um, to the Australian immigration system and the, and the way in which they unpleasantly treated anyone trying to get, claim asylum in Australia, put them on some kind of floating prison. Um, and I just think that... I'm just doing the visual similarity thing. You know, it's almost like this, this thing was not designed as a, as a kind of floating um, detention camp, 
but it has been turned into one. It does have a bar and some, you know, some kind of comfort facilities, but it also uh, had Legionnaire's disease. And yeah, again, we were just referring to this idea of state violence and the idea that Balibar puts out that, um, you know, the, the, the state is uh, constituted by acts of violence, you know, it, it gathers upon to itself the, the right to exercise violence within its territorial limits, and this is one of the founding principles of uh, the modern nation state, as if it, if it can, you know, either it, it extends to its citizens the right to commit violence in its name or have violence committed in their name, uh, but also the idea of borders, the idea of international borders, that while these people are able to sit in international waters and claim that they're citizens of nowhere. The true citizens of nowhere, people who attempt to contravene the, uh, the, the nation state system by trying to claim their completely legal right to claim refugee status in, a, in another country, um, end up in the same kind of architectural container as the libertarian floating seasteading community of, of AI land. Um, what remains is what we might call drosscape. These are shots of failed architecture of Albania, which uh, famously left behind after the collapse of various Ponzi schemes. Um, you know, we, we, country after communism, pyramid schemes flourished, the whole thing went bust and very famously collapsed in a huge violent con conflagration which tore the country apart. What remains are skeletons of real estate. Um, and here, of course, we see a photo essay and recall that slide of Zaha Hadid's freeway with the car, cars driving past and the glitch structure. Here we see a photograph of the failed architecture of um, um, Albania shot from a moving car. So this is the counterpoint to Patrick Schumacher's design for, uh, or Zaha Hadid's design for Hong Kong Polytechnic University's Innovation Tower. Failed architecture shot from the freeway. Drosscape. And that waste, that risk, is part of the system. This is what is hedged against. You know? The failure of these projects, the waste uh, and the extraction of resources that go into these projects. This will always hedge against the decentralized state. Uh, and that risk will always be um, minimized for those with the capital to both extract and speculate at the same time. And that's kind of my thesis. Okay, that's it.